Right. Well, welcome everybody to the Horses and Human Research Foundation's fourth webinar. Tonight, we have two dynamic speakers to discuss important topics on research. Before we begin, I just would like to remind everybody that our webinar series occurs typically on the first Thursday of the month. We moved it this month because of the 4th of July, but typically we try for the first Thursday of the month. As you may know, our mission is to provide sustained investment in rigorous research. We just ended an application for entities to request funding for their research at their locations. And we highly encourage everyone tonight to make sure to check out our website to learn about funding opportunities in the future, how you can donate, or how you can become an active member in this organization. Also, we have a YouTube channel, which all of the webinars are posted in. So if you've missed the first three, please feel free to check that out and see what good content you missed. Finally, we are going to be having our first ever and in-person conference on October 30th and 31st in North Carolina. Visit our website in the weeks to come to learn more about that. A few housekeeping items. Please remember to keep yourself muted as the presenters are speaking. We will have time after each presenter to ask questions, but also feel free to use that chat box to interact with other participants, share any relevant information, or pose any questions. So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And without further ado and great excitement, I will pass the mic over to Evelyn. Again, please feel free to type in any questions in the chat box, but we will also have a few minutes at the end to ask specific questions to Evelyn. Evelyn, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm, I'm very grateful to see so many people calling in. Um, as you can see, you can read for yourself, so I won't, I won't read it out for you, but I am an executive coach, um, an author. Um, I have a program that I've developed in equine facilitated executive coaching. I'm also a horse trainer, and I have worked with uh, off-the-track thoroughbreds, um, teaching them ground manners and how to behave like real horses instead of just racehorses. Um, I'm interested very much in the science as well. And um, I became involved with Horses and Human Research Foundation, I guess about three years ago, a little over three and a half. Um, so I want, I want to quickly tell you about this project. Deborah, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, this project came out of a series of meetings between HHRF and an organization that's based in Europe, Horses in Education and Therapy International, other, otherwise known as HETI. And we've been meeting uh, for, I think, over a year to talk about ways in which we can collaborate because we have overlapping missions. Um, Horses and Humans Research Foundation uh, mission is to, you know, fund rigorous research. HETI's mission is to facilitate, facilitate the worldwide collaboration between organizations and individuals whose objectives are philanthropic, scientific, and educational in the field of equine assisted activities. So it was, so we have a, a lot of commonalities and common interests. And over the course of time that we were meeting, um, we started to talk about access to research and hearing from so many people that getting access to good research was difficult. So um, in this webinar, I want to present to you the findings that we've developed in, in the area of trying to deal with this issue. And so I want, to, I want to tell you about our findings and hopefully engage you in helping us move forward to create a resource that would be available to all of those who are interested in equine assisted services. Deborah, could you please change the slide? Thanks. So I've already addressed this, the origins of this in terms of our two organizations meeting and discussing ways in which we can collaborate. Deborah, could you please move to the next slide? Yeah, so um, what we were hearing was that unless you're connected to a university, most people do not have direct access or any access, especially without paying for it, to research. And um, people were saying that they couldn't find what what was interesting to them in their specific 
area of interest, um, that it was you know, too much money. They couldn't afford the journal articles. They couldn't afford the paywall stuff. Um, but the other interesting thing was that what we were finding was that even when people could find research, they couldn't tell if it was all the research or the latest research and how well it was being received and reviewed by peers or other um, experts in the field. So I decided to I'd do some, spend some time investigating this for us. And what I found by starting off with good old Google was this was a list of the places that do have research, some research. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen some of these sources, certainly Google Scholar, a semantic scholar is a great one. Science Direct, Academia EDU is also a great one. ResearchGate, I couldn't actually get access to because I believe you need to have an account and there may be some funding involved, but I'm told they have a collection of research in our field. PubMed, of course, is a source. Wiley, um, online research articles. And then there's a one that's um, equine assisted interventions based in Europe is one person who's dedicated herself, I believe it's a woman, to collecting links to research that she's been um, become aware of. Um, next slide, please, Deborah. So looking at what was available, uh, by the way, the other thing that I did do when I found research articles was I look in the bibliography and see what other pointers there were to other sources. And again, ran into blocks in some cases, but that was how I accumulated that list. Um, so what, basically in summary, what I found was that there wasn't a single source that we could go to, to find you know, an authoritative complete list of, of research available, um, complete and current. Frequently, of course, that you know you need to have a membership to get access to journal articles, and you need to pay. You need to have access um, as a faculty member, student, or researcher if to connect to a, a university to get access to their their repositories. The other thing that's a barrier in terms of getting access is the long cycle for publishing research, and that can be, I'm told, as long as two or three years, sometimes more to get through that publishing cycle. So there's the time involved in doing the research and then add on another two to four years before that research is gonna become available and published, usually in a, a journal. Um, another barrier to research we're finding is language barriers. And, and so we are hoping that we're gonna be able to create a resource that will address that one as well. Um, what I discovered too, I actually signed up for a course in institutional repositories and found it overwhelmingly dense in terms of how repositories are created and managed. The terminology is, can be also off-putting because there are so many different concepts and terms involved in trying, to, in trying to gather or get access to something that's of interest to someone. Um, so the solution, I'm not sure what slide we're on, but I think Deborah, can you go to the next one, please? Uh, yeah, so the solution, what I did find was that uh, instead of considering things like Google type searching on specific organizational sites, um, there are such things as aggregators. And I'm gonna talk about them in a little more detail in a minute. But I also discovered um, an organization called the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, which is, um, multi-country um, effort, um, sort of open source or community source, looking at defining the, the best qualities for repositories, the best uh, processes and definitions around what features and functionality ought to be available. So I spent some time reviewing their information and I encourage you to do the same if you're interested in repositories. Um, it's called coar.org, I believe. Um, so they're pointing the way and developing and, and using it as a, a source for other organizations to look at creating their own repositories or combining their needs with existing organizations that have repositories. 
But to get back to um, the aggregators, we found, in fact, I was also working with Anton Saratov, who's a board member of HETI based in Moscow. And An Anton's had an interest in this subject for quite some time. So he was the one who found um, an aggregator that I'm gonna show you in a few minutes. An aggregator basically is a way of creating an interface with back end um, hooks that you can hook into sources across the web. So it's not a Google per se, because it's not looking everywhere. It's looking specifically where we tell it to look. So we could point it to that list of sources that I just cited to you, as well as others. And it then creates a single interface that you can go to, you can save your criteria, you can create collections for yourself, and I'll show you some of that. But it's, it's a resource that is probably going to be much more useful. Rather than someone going from one site to another site to another site, we can create a single interface. Um, let me see. I th these features and functionality are some of the things that we would get. Um, they're considered some of the best practice results. But discoverability is one of the primary ones. We have to be able to search and find. Um, Search engines are great, but if you can't discover what you're looking for, then you're not, you're not getting anywhere. So the issue of being able to find the latest research or find the, the type of research that's specific to your keywords and interests is one of the functions that we need to ensure is there, is built in. Access, of course, open access. Um, so that, that means that people who aren't necessarily members of universities, um, who aren't necessarily um, subscribing to a specific journals um, can get access to some of these sources. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be no cost to those sources, but at least you would be able to discover them and, and see perhaps abstracts and that sort of thing. Um, reuse, the, the notion of uh, finding it and being able to reuse it elsewhere, saving collections and that sort of thing. Governance is something that is um, uh, something that we would want to look at if we were to move forward and create this resource for ourselves. We'd want to have some governance around how it was constructed, how it was editorialized, editorialized how it was, um, how, how we decided on access and management. Altmetrics are something that are also the things that um, I believe all researchers are interested in. And there would need to be a support function. So if I'm going to this resource and I'm having a problem seeing something or accessing something or I don't understand something, I should have a contact email or some sort of way of getting answers to questions that I have. Um, I'm seeing questions coming in and that's wonderful. Um, Andrea, could you, uh, Deborah, yes. would, you, would you please move to the next slide, Deborah? This is the Science Open, which is the best solution that um, we found so far. And this is an aggregator. And I'm going to take you and show you a live version of it um, if we have time. But as you can see, it, it represents the ideal set of conditions and features that we would want for our particular equine assisted services research topic. Um, you can go to this interface and I encourage you to try it on your own after this webinar. You can go to scienceopen.com. You can, you don't even have to create an account. You can go and search um, and look for the kinds of features and functionality that it has. It's very richly featured. It doesn't have, it's not set up as a repository for equine assisted service yet, services yet, although there are articles in there that um, have been put in there from other kind of subject matter areas like veterinary science um, or medical science. So there are some topics in there that you might be able to find of interest. We've been looking at this as a potential solution and are looking for feedback and interest from people in the field of equine assisted services in terms of their level of interest in having this kind of a resource available, how, how they would like to, to use it, um, how valuable it might be for them. 
Um, let me see. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you very much. So suffice it to say, um, Anton and I are working on a project um, and a few other people who are starting to step forward and, and uh, volunteer to carry this forward. This particular interface would cost some dollars to set up to customize for our particular services or research that we're interested in. There would be a setup fee, there would be annual fees for an organization. There would, we would need to have a curatorial board, which would likely be a volunteer board, and we would need some volunteers to support the functionality and answer questions around it. But what we're, we're proposing as a joint project of HHRF and HETI is that we move this forward, we look for funding to set this up, and apparently there are some sources that we can start to look for. Um, so what we want to do is, is gather the interest and see if we can take this forward to the whole community of globally of equine assisted services practitioners, researchers, um, anyone who's interested in seeing the research results. Um, next slide, please, Deborah. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about this part. The call to action for this presentation is, I'd love your feedback. You can put it in the, in the chat box at the end um, or now. Um, I'd love volunteers to join a working group. I've set up an email address specifically for this project. It's eas.researchproject at gmail.com. So anyone who has feedback, who has questions, who's interested in volunteering, please do contact us at that email address. We are also planning to put out a survey. So we're working on a survey that we wanna be able to put out as widely as possible globally, because HETI, as I said, is European based. HHRF is based largely in North America, but we would like to reach as wide an audience as possible. The survey we're hoping to launch in the fall, have it done by mid-November at the latest, have the results uh, compiled and accumulated, and then issue a report and take the next steps, which hopefully will be moving forward with the volunteer group to seek funding, to make a contract, with this particular company, or we may in the interim find another one that's perhaps better, um, but so far we haven't found one. And the idea is that sometime in 2022, we would be able to launch the EAS research repository for all interested parties. Um, I think I'm gonna share my screen now and show you uh, the live version of, um, where is it, share screen, the live version of this repository. And I don't have it up yet, hold on a second. There. Can you all see that? Um, this is my little account that I've set up and just done a, a search here on equine assisted and the results come up. So this is basically how it functions in this single interface. So instead of going to a long list of different sources, you can come to one place and find the research that you're looking for. So I've got 268 articles. One, uh, 15 books and one book chapter in this list of results. Um, this is, you can, you can create collections, multiple collections on here. So you might create collections based on whatever your particular keynote or key uh, words might be. You might co collect by author, by topic, by um, specific keywords. And, and um, you can save those and do all the researching that you wish in addition to that. Um, this shows the publishers that are in, in this 284 results is represented by these five publishers. So El Sevier, MDPI, never heard of that one. Informa UK, never heard of that one. 
Sage, of course, I've heard of, and Wiley, I'm sure you've heard of. It also lists the journals where these articles can be found. Um, as I said, these ones are primarily in fields not equine assisted services related, but in this one is social work, um, veterinary science, environmental research and public health. So any other those types of areas that overlap in terms of our specific discipline. And here are the disciplines listed. Um, narrow by keyword, equine assisted therapy. So I could click on one of these and it would it would reduce the results that I'm seeing here just to those um, particular keywords. So going back and looking at the results, um, you can see content, authors, it's not showing me that, don't know why. Um, collections, I haven't set up. I had thought I had set up, but this may not relate to the, this specific set of keywords. Featured, um, don't know what that means yet. Um, journals that may be uh, related to these articles and publishers. So going back here to the content, there are also um, other features, namely the, um, the results for this set of keywords. I can add another filter. So I might say equine assisted and autism, for instance, and see if that brought me a different result set. I can save this search. I can share this search on Facebook, email, or Twitter. I can export citations. I can sort by altmetric score. And I know that altmetrics is, is something that researchers are very keen on um, because it's, it's going to, the, the higher your score is, of course, the more citations you're seeing. So this is, this is um, a way of showing you how, Im, how much impact you're having out there in the world with, with your articles. 21 views on this particular article. Um, this is 26 citations. Now, there's also an ability here, I think you probably have to have an account, but you can, you know, from a social um, science perspective, social science, but from, um, what's the word I'm seeking? I can't remember. But what you can do is say, I love this article, or I don't like this article, and I'm giving it one star. So the, the our authors in this particular article can see how well it's being received by others who are seeing seeing the article. You also have the ability here, there, there's a lot of functionality here, as I've said many times. Um, there, there are functions that allow you to reach out to the authors. I'm just looking for that. Let's try this one. Um, this is the kind of features that you get when you look at individual articles. You can find this article at somewhere other than Science Open. You can download it, you can review it, you can bookmark it, you can export as a citation. Ah, and this is what I'm looking for. Uh, most reference authors, it, it appears that there's a way of connecting to the authors if they so wish, if they're gonna provide their contact information then you may be able to um, connect to authors and ask them questions through whatever connection uh, information they may provide. Um, let's see. So I'm down to the last five minutes and I wanna know what questions you have that I could answer possibly. Vanessa had a question in the chat box. Um, the search engines such as ProQuest or JSTOR, are those mainly used for just faculty and researchers on who are connected to campuses or universities? Um, I've heard of JSTOR, but I honestly do not know that much about it. I myself am not a researcher. I have worked in IT and in educational fields, but I'm not myself a researcher, so I'm not the best person to answer that question. I didn't come across those two um, when I was doing my search. Okay. So, so I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that. Um, I just, if I could just jump in. So, so my question I think was less because I'm, I am a faculty member at a university in Canada and we do use some of them um, more, there are some research engines, let's say have a 
what's the term I'm looking for, um, more accreditation, um, a higher standard than others. Some of those would be like store, for example, ProQuest, um, Science Direct, as opposed to, let's say, some other search engines that might not have the same uh, credibility, um, shall we say, than some others. So I'm just not sure because, of course, I have access to all of these. Right. And so I'm just not sure whether other people can access them. You know, if you're not a faculty member at a university, are you able to access them? Yeah, that's that's probably um, an issue if it's if it's um, a repository that belongs to a specific institution. No, they um, they don't belong to specific institutions. They don't. So no, they're um, search engines that all institutions typically subscribe to. So I think usually it's through their library systems, and they all subscribe okay. to. Perhaps um, I don't really know how it. Like, right. I don't know how I have access to these things. I just know I have access to yeah. these. Things. That, well, again, that might be because you. Uh, it may be a resource that's available to institutions, um, but people who are not members of institutions in some way don't get access to those. That's that's a likely um, condition. But thank you for raising that, Vanessa. Which university are you at? Um, I'm at Western University in Ontario. Uh Great, thank you for that. Well, and I had a quick question because I was new to the website that you shared, the Science Open. Um, and I'm curious, because I did the same search as you are walking it through. And so I know that not it's um, supporting open source, but of course not everything is open source yet. So like the very first article that popped up gave you the name and the brief abstract and the author's names, but the article isn't open. Is it up to the authors, though, to even put the abstract in there, or is that some behind the scenes entity that does that? Do you know? Um, well, the, the creation of the abstract or it's turning up on this science open site? Turning up on the science open site. Um, it's uh, let me see if I can answer that question. The abstract is a, a function of publishing. So it is created by the, either the journal or the authors in somewhere in the publishing process. It's, um, um, it would show up on Science Open as a result of us pointing it to the, the repository that holds that article. So the information that is possible to make available, just to take that question a little bit further, this could be an article that isn't really available without paying for it, but it's available in terms of the abstract and the title. And, and the, so it, it, it offers the knowledge to people that it exists, but it doesn't guarantee that it will be offered free to consume. Does that make sense? It does. I I was trying to figure out if it was more like ResearchGate, which is a website that's used pretty heavily now by newer researchers. I'm not sure about um, people who have been in the field for a while, but that onus, if you will, is on the shoulders of the researchers um, that they yeah. have to copy and paste the abstract onto ResearchGate but then it's also connected to their email. So anybody who searches equine assisted has the contact information for those authors. So I'm just curious, is that, you know, and I think you answered the question, as long as the authors have published it, this, oh, the science open does the work for everybody that it's the onus isn't on the researchers again to carry it into that search engine. Yes. Now, the other thing is that uh, Science Open has the capacity to publish. Um, there's an extra charge for that, but um, Science Open could become the publisher of, uh, and it would depend on, you know, you as to whether or not you'd want to make use of Science Open to do that, you the author or, or set of authors, but, but Science Open can, in fact, become a publisher, and I believe they can also handle peer review um, processing. They also have the ability to publish conferences and manage um, submissions to, to conferences. Um, there's a whole lot of functionality that we haven't even touched upon in this. And, and so part of what we would want to do in terms of moving this project forward is investigate all of those fully. 
because Hetty, in fact, is a publisher. They they do publish a, a journal of research. So um, this could become a replacement for that for Hetty. We're not suggesting we're there yet, but in I mean, Hetty has an interest in continuing to publish their journal. Um, so any other questions? Is that answering your question, Andrea? It did, thank you. Um, we had a great conversation in the chat box going, so we're going to connect you, Evelyn, with Jenny, since she has been a researcher with the federal government looking at some of these same issues on scientific oh. knowledge and the access. So we're gonna connect the two of you. Great. Um, any other questions? Evelyn, thank you so much for sharing all this wonderful information on the digital knowledge base. And I cannot wait to hear more feedback that you get from that email on more um, questions and considerations as you move forward on hopefully getting access for everybody out there to access the research that's already been conducted and that's published out there. So what an important topic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank, thank you, you all. With excitement again, we will now transition over to Nancy. Again, we'll have a few minutes at the end to ask any questions, but feel free to also utilize the chat box. Nancy, I will hand the mic over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I'm really glad to see the diversity in the chat box of uh, who's here and really pleased to be part of HHRF. Uh, so the research readiness in equine assisted services, you know, really Evelyn hand, handed, she, she was the perfect one to open this um, because that was one of the biggest identified needs when I gave this talk uh, as part of a panel at the last in-person PATH conference. Um, I run a, I'm the executive director of an equine assisted services for children in the upstate of South Carolina, it's called Halter, and the president of the board of directors for the Horses and Humans Research Foundation. Next slide, please. So our goal tonight is to identify what kind of questions that you want to answer and really make sure you're ready to to conduct research or to become involved in research and look at what are some resources that are needed for successful research. And one of those is exactly what Evelyn just gave you, which is an understanding of what's already been done in the field. If you don't have access to current research, it's gonna be really important that you partner with someone who does. Next slide, please. So, if you're thinking about becoming involved in research, and research, it, it can be just this daunting word. It's, um, you know, HHRF talks about rigorous scientific research, but I think it starts with a question. What do you want to know? And what are you going to do with it? What's already been done? Are there potential partners, ideally universities or hospitals, who have access to some of those research websites that you may not have access to? Find out whether what you want to study has already been done. What makes it different? But more than anything else, what we're talking about here is applied research not just asking a question to ask the question, but asking a question to potentially make sure you don't change something that is working or do change something that might work better. So really keeping these questions at the forefront is really important. And just because you may decide you're not research ready today doesn't mean you will never be research ready. It's a process. There isn't anybody who's ever done a scrap of research who came into this world knowing how to do research. These are learned skills, just like riding a horse. Next slide, please. 
So hopefully everybody got the link to download this form. I didn't want to go through it on the, uh, you know, page by page there, but we're going to talk about this. It is four pages long, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, and invite you to look at the copy that hopefully you printed. So there's a little bit of a story behind this checklist. I had developed one, and I had a conversation with Robin Gabriels and found out that she had developed one. And then Caitlin Peters had developed one based on Robin Gabriels. Mine came more from a center perspective and theirs came more from a researcher perspective. So we decided to work on this together and that's what, that's what you have here. And we did present this, uh, as I said, at the PATH conference several years ago. Um, but this is yours and you can distribute it. And it, it's like any other checklist, it gives you an idea of where you are. So we're going to go through that uh, checklist here and just kind of talk about a few pieces of it. The first thing is really center experience. Just because you've never participated in a research project doesn't mean you can't. But I would suggest that you may not be ready for a big federal grant. You may want to start with a smaller project. And even before you start with a research project, I would encourage you to learn about logic models. And there's all kinds of research on logic models. There's a bazillion YouTube videos on logic models. They are my go-to tool. When I think about not just research, but adding a program, they walk me through a set of questions about what is it that I'm trying to do? And what is it that I need to do it? A great way to dip your foot in the pool is to do a program evaluation. And maybe not even of all of the services that you offer. If you're at a center that you may want to do a program evaluation of one service. Therapeutic riding, equine assisted learning, hippotherapy, or even just speech therapy. It's a great way to understand what goes into beginning to gather data and analyze it. You do not have to be a PATH center. You don't have to be an accredited center. But what I will tell you is that Many grantors want to see that you have some level of qualification. While HHRF has funded studies that were not affiliated with any particular organizational approach, we do look to see, are there a set of standards that you're following? So if that's something that you know you want to do, I would say at minimum join that organization and potentially become an accredited center or another some kind of accreditation. So a lot of this is good business. Make sure that governance and guidance documents are in place and make sure that kind of moving down a little bit that you're going to do something with the information. If you're the only one in your organization that cares about research, you might have a hard road to move on if you want to use the data that you gather. For example, here at Halter, we've been doing research on all, across all of our therapeutic riding participants. And we've used a tool called the PDCAT. It's P-E-D-I-C-A-T. Now the children that we see here, for the most part, are really low functioning. So we didn't expect to see a big change in physical abilities or cognitive abilities. What we have focused on for this past year, and we've just gotten our full, full first year of data, was increasing their individual 
responsibility. And I am ecstatic because that's exactly what we found. So that helps us to know that we're on the right track. That's something that we can report out to our donors, to the parents themselves. They now get a three, a three time report about what is going on with their child. And we didn't develop this. This is a standardized measure. There's a lot of emphasis on grant funding now and being able to show results. And these kinds of assessment tools, even if you never publish a research study, may be helpful to you in talking to some donors and also to funding sources. So make sure, again, at the individual center level that you have capacity in terms of the financial part. You want to make sure that you're never commingling your funds. Grant funds should always stay separate and should never be part of your everyday operations. Be careful when you're looking for funding because some are reimbursement grants. That means you have to have the money up front. And if you hear nothing else tonight, don't ignore the staff. Make sure that key staff members, executive director, program director, are vested in this project. If you're at a stage of organizational growth where you're really overwhelmed, you're short staffed and the money's really tight, this may not be the time to move forward, but once you get a little bit more stable, no pun intended, may be the time to look at a research project. This checklist is really good for basic kinds of things. Your facility is safe. So if you'll move to the next slide. This is really important. Don't let the research project rule the center. There's nothing that should endanger participants, volunteers, staff, or horses. Now, this is a, you know, a, a picture off the internet. This could be a great horse and rider combination, but this picture right here uh, doesn't make me feel real safe. So make sure that you have safety first. Next slide, please. Make sure that you have horses that are suitable. Again, good program work, that they're suitable and they're healthy, not just physically, but mentally. As we begin to really understand more and more about horses, and we really need research on the horses in equine assisted services, we, we are responsible, we need to be good stewards of them. We should never sacrifice our horses for research or for anything else. Next slide, please. So this is really a summary of many of the pieces that you have to have. Your staff needs to be consistent. And I would say that you don't want brand new staff who have just joined your organization or or brand new staff who are just starting on their journey as a provider of services. They have a hard enough time, unless that's the focus and you wanna measure the impact. Make sure that your horses are consistent because to measure what you want to measure, you have to keep many of the other things consistent. At the same time, I'm not sure of any other industry that needs the level of flexibility that we do. So you want to make sure that you have both consistency and volunteers and staff and equines and flexibility in the other pieces. Next slide, please. So here, this is really it in a summary. Facility, 
administrative practices, staff, volunteers, and horses. And, and I have to note that Robin Gabriel's initially developed this slide for the pre other presentation that we did and that we've modified it from there. On site, you really need an intervention leader. You need somebody who is really managing this. And you need somebody who is the point person for getting the data, getting it to the right people, making sure that it's secure. And that, in, that person needs to go through what we call city training. And that's not, you're not going to find that on this slide. But city training is required for researchers in order to make sure that no harm is coming to the participants in the research. And make sure you've got the right training and skills and licenses. If you say you're doing therapy, make sure you have a licensed therapist. It's really important that you don't overstate what you're doing. I think we're all fighting that phrase, equine therapy. Next slide, please. So there's a couple of things that you can, you can look for. Just even to understand how you might fund or go about research is look at grant proposals. The Horses and Humans Research Foundation typically funds one grant a year. We'd like to expand that. So we're always looking for donors. We want to research not just the impact of the horse-human relationship on humans, we want to know the impact on horses. So look at grant proposals. They will tell you a tremendous amount. They become a checklist in and of themselves. And of course, share this research readiness checklist and develop relationships. I would say it's crucial to develop a relationship with a qualified researcher. Make sure that you understand what their needs are and they understand what your needs are. They may think that you have total control over your schedule in a center, when in fact you've made a commitment to people that they're going to ride at particular times or participate at particular times, or you may have existing contracts. Be honest about your capacity and recognize that if this is something you want to do, you may want to change your capacity. For example, I've included that you need a covered arena because if you don't, you're going to be interrupted by weather. And that may give you a very different capacity to perform what you need to do. Maybe you can get by without it, but you've also got to be able to, to say that it wasn't the weather that created any changes. That being said, I was involved in an autism research project, one of the early ones on therapeutic riding. And because of the weather, even with a covered arena, we ended up missing a number of weeks for snow in Eastern Virginia. We didn't get a lot of snow, but it created a great design and we utilize that design. Get educated on research. The conference that HHRF will be holding in upstate North Carolina in October is going to help you learn about terminology. It's really geared for both researchers and for centers and providers interested in research. We want to educate people so that the scientists know what's going on with centers and the centers understand when the scientists and the research say, I need 30 people with pretty much the same condition. What does that mean? What is an N? How do you read an abstract and get useful information? No, you're right, only, Nancy. Yes. Also, are you going to have a, con a, a control group who will not take the TR services? Are you ready for that? Exactly. Yes. 
That is an important point. What is a control group and what does it mean? So helping everybody gain some science literacy and some understanding of what centers need as far as information and really helping to develop those connections is a big goal of HHRF. So next slide please. With that, I will go to questions. Thank you so much, Nancy. Vanessa had an excellent question and I'm probably going to expand on it a bit. Um, but as faculty, Vanessa notes that before they can conduct any research, they have to submit to their board of ethics or the IRB to ensure that no animals or humans are harmed in any way. But what if your research expert is not affiliated with any university? Is there a board or a review ethics committee that HHRF can point us to in those cases? So every community has one. And so you can do this a couple of ways. If you're working with a state agency, every state agency that might do research, for example, I'm working with the South Carolina Department of Mental Health, they have their own IRB, Institutional Review Board. That's the one that says, we're not gonna hurt people. And so there are ones available in the community. Sometimes it takes a little bit to find them, uh, but there's not a single one. They, they are locality-based. And then the other one is what they call iCook, and that is the care and care of animals. And that is a different one, and many of the, um, the vet schools have them, other research uh, universities and hospitals will have them. I do not believe they have those at the community level. So you may need to partner or get, get somebody to work through that. And I see Mark Chrisman in the, in the audience, so Mark may have a better answer than I do about iCook and potentially can actually explain that better. Um, can you hear me, Nancy? Yes, thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's uh, IACUC stands for Institutional uh, Animal Care and Use Committee. And over the years, they have, the universities have really upregulated the intensity of these committees and the training that you have to go through. Uh, it borders on painful, but it is a necessity because a lot of these universities are publicly funded, uh, which means there are eyes on them constantly. So when you submit a proposal, the IACUC group committee goes through it with a fine tooth comb, but it's a pretty, it, it can be quite a rigorous process. Um, but we have to do it even for all our labs. Uh, you're not allowed to, you know, lead, pick up a horse's foot more than once. It's, it's re almost gone too far, but unfortunately it's a necessity, but yes, it is a very rigorous approval process. Um, in the ethics arena. And it's important that you may get a pass that says this does not need iCook approval, but you may need to get that pass. HHRF says you've got to let us know whether you have approval or whether iCook said you didn't need approval. And that also can be true of an IRB, Institutional Review Board. Other questions? I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any, but please feel free to enter those in. We'll wait another few seconds. I'm always hoping that it's like an iPhone where you'll see the dot, dot, dot and the, the text messages, but that's not how Zoom works. So <laughs> one thing that I did want to say is this tonight is really a result of the, the conference at uh, presentation at PATH in 2019, because one of the biggest complaints is that people did not know where to find research. And so the work that Evelyn has done and dove into uh, in looking at repositories and, and working, you know, cross 
with somebody in uh, the in Russia to really put this information together is really a response to that request. Where do we find research? And one of the things that we want to do at HHRF is to be able to continue this conversation and provide more information on what's out there. The conference also, we plan to try and present some of the research that's been done. For example, what what Evelyn had pulled up was actually an article in 2014 that said equine assisted services for mental health lacked empirical research. Well, we know that. That's kind of what we're, we're all about. We're trying to answer that question and solve some of those issues. And that's going to take all of us. And that's really what HHRF is striving to do here. Mm -hmm. well, Nancy, thank you so much for your remarks tonight. And you're right on the money with that, uh, particularly telling people to read the specifications. That will tell you whether or not you have the capacity. And if you think you do, try to write the abstract. And that will really tell you whether or not you can do it or not. And, and also, uh, whether it's a federal or a state uh, RFP, uh, look for collaboration. That can often be the clincher for getting the grant. Build those relationships with hospitals and universities. Right. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing information on what we should consider when we contemplate starting research at our locations. Just what an important topic and valuable information. So Nancy and Evelyn, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge tonight. I know we just scraped the surface, but we are so grateful. We look forward to seeing everybody next month. Our August webinar will be um, discussing how to support clients who are in various stages of trauma recovery. Our presenters will host a fireside chat, so please bring questions and be ready to interact. And remember, if you're enjoying these webinar series, check out our YouTube channel and consider joining us for our conference in October. More information to come soon, so look for that. Have a great night, everyone, and we'll see you next month and hopefully at the conference in person. Thank you, Evelyn and Nancy. We appreciate it.